Hello everybody and welcome to the first of a series of lessons covering the A-level history syllabus uh, relating to Tsarist and Communist Russia. Now, this is a series of lessons that we've done before. However, we did this a very long time ago, a few years ago, and uh, we wanted to do uh, an update, essentially, to, to, to remake these lessons uh, almost as like a second edition with, the, with, uh, with better technology in terms of improved mics, for example, uh, more articulate, uh, correcting any minor mistakes that had been made in the previous series, etc etc just to really revamp this series of lessons and so what we're going to do in this lesson specifically is take a look at the background to the state of russia in 1855 so we'll talk a little bit about the history of russia the geographical understanding of of the russian state and then we will talk about alexander ii and we'll talk about the first of the major issues that we're going to cover which is that of the emancipation of serfdom so that is the essentially the agenda for this lesson. It is the first lesson for our study of Tsarist and Communist Russia. It's specifically focused on the AQA, A-Level History Syllabus. So we're covering Russia, essentially the Russian history from the years of 1855, which is the reign of Alexander II, all the way to 1964, which is the end of the reign, uh, reign in inverted commas, of, of Nikita Khrushchev. So we're going to cover the, the last years uh, and the last three monarchs of the Romanov dynasty. We'll talk about the Russian Revolution. We'll talk about the establishment of a communist Soviet Union. And we'll talk about the reigns of Lenin, Stalin, and then Khrushchev. This is also a series of lessons that could be used for anyone who is studying OCR or Edexcel history as well. Um, in terms of the content, in terms of the actual history that is covered, if you are studying history between those two periods or any history in that particular set of um, uh, lessons, then of course you are going to be able to um, utilize these lessons as well. You're going to be able to utilize the study of these lessons too. It is also going to be very useful for those who are studying the AQA A-level syllabus but are doing revolution and dictatorship, which is the, um, the, the, the set of paper two option, which is essentially covering Russian history from 1917 to 1952 or 1954. Um, so essentially, the, the, the beauty of these lessons is we're covering quite a broad amount of history, we're covering quite a long uh, period of history. And what we're doing is essentially um, covering what would be the content in a number of different syllabus uh, and a number of different specifications. So we're going to examine the following things. We're going to examine the background to Russian history in this lesson, the Crimean War and the impact of the Crimean War on the Russian state, as well as the issue of emancipation with Alexander II. So let's begin first by thinking about Russian history. Okay, Now, the period in history that we are examining is the latter years of the Romanov dynasty within Russian history. Now, we can sort of divide Russian history in terms of the monarchies uh, between two major dynasties. You have the Rurikid dynasty and then you have the Romanov dynasty. Now, the extent to which we can say that this is Russian history is a little bit uh, is a little bit difficult because the state of Russia didn't actually exist until the Petrine Revolution of Peter the Great and the uh, and the sort of uh, the the development and modernization of the establishment of a Russian Empire that was done under his reign, and that was even that was in the sort of late sixteen early seventeen hundreds. Peter the Great dies in seventeen twenty five. But what is the area, the geographical area that we would describe today as Russia, which begins as, uh, as a number of different tribal groups, which becomes and forms part of what is known as the Kievan Rus, which then develops into major principalities. So the Principality of Muscovy, the Principality of Novgorod, etc., etc., uh, which then forms into um, a more unified uh, relationship, a more unified state. This begins around the year 9 AD in terms of the Rurikid dynasty. Now, it is almost semi-mythical, the beginnings of the Rurikid dynasty. King Rurik uh, was, the, as the story goes, a Viking who was invited to rule over the, uh, over the, uh, over the, the, the tribal lands of the Rus. And this Rurikid dynasty would last until the reign of Ivan IV, or Ivan the Terrible. Ivan the Terrible will die without any heirs because he kills his son, and then the result of which leads to a period of civil war within, uh, within the Principality of Muscovy and, and the, the, the areas around, which is known as the Time of Troubles. 
during this period you have a number of different people uh, vying for uh, vying for the throne you have a number of people claiming to be uh, false kings and false uh, czars uh, in terms of in, in terms of in terms of they're trying to essentially have a false claim to the throne you also have one person who is trying his very best being um, boris gudinov to actually be able to 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 keep stability within the area within the region the results would end with the um r the, the 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 russian aristocracy the boyars inviting the next major king, the next major czar of Russia, Mikhail I, to found a new dynasty. This is Mikhail Romanov, um, who founds the dynasty in 1613. And at that point, we get the Romanov dynasty that we are talking about in this uh, series of lessons. So Mikhail I founds the, the, the Romanov dynasty. We go from Mikhail I all the way through. Um, there are a number of uh, monarchs in between these. We go through Mikhail I to Alexei. Then we go to, uh, and then we eventually get to Peter, Peter the Great. We then uh, have a couple of uh, interim monarchs. We then get Catherine the Great. And then we get people such as Alexander the First, who uh, who fights against Napoleon. And now we get to uh, this period here in 1855, which is Alexander the Second. Okay. Now, Russia itself, from a geographical perspective, was very very large, and it was economically underdeveloped, especially compared to the rest of the uh, of the Western world, especially when we're talking about Western Europe. The ratio of village to town dwellers was around one to eleven. So, in terms of the ratio of of people and the and the ways in which that impacted their socioeconomic conditions, we see a, a, a quite a significant um, uh, disparity between those two different groups. We also have a number of problems in relation to education. Around 85% of the Russian population were illiterate. So, of course, this is a very problematic issue when we're talking about the development socioeconomically of the Russian state. Serfdom was still very much in force in, 1859, uh, in 1855. Now, what serfdom essentially was is a form of slavery to an extent where essentially the workers are forced to uh, to work on the land that is owned by the person, the uh, the aristocrat or the noble or the boyar in terms of Russian history, and they're not allowed to leave. Essentially, that is the the idea of serfdom. It was still very much in force in 1855. The Russian Empire was ruled by an autocratic czar. Now, the word czar essentially is a a Slavic um, uh, utilization of the word Caesar. OK, it was first used officially as a title of a Russian monarch by uh, Ivan the Fourth, Ivan the Terrible. However, his grandfather um, and people before him, people like Vasily the, Vasily the Third, would refer to himself as Tsar in letters and correspondence. So that it was sort of uh, so at least people like Vasily the Third and Ivan the uh, Third would would were dipping their toes in the water in terms of seeing whether or not they could get away with using the word czar. It becomes officially a, the first official czar becomes Ivan the Terrible, and this would be the the title of monarch that goes all the way through the the, the end of the Rurikid and into the Romanov dynasty. The Tsar was also the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, Russian Orthodoxy was something that is incredibly important. Um, uh, and uh, the the religion that was adopted was adopted by uh, Vladimir the, the, the first, uh, at least mythically being the case. And one of the interesting um, bits of information as to the reason as to why it was Vladimir the first who adopted uh, Christianity. Uh, famously, he saw all of the other uh, Abrahamic religions and he saw that with um, Islam, the choice between Christianity and Islam, he had to uh, give up uh, alcohol and not drink alcohol with islam and so that ruled out islam <laughs> and as a result he chose christianity the extent to which that was actually true is obviously debated by historians but it is quite a funny uh, piece of trivia nonetheless in 1855 as well we have the crimean war so russian uh, the the russian czar at the time alexander ii would become czar in march of 1855 and at this point, we see Russia coming into the final stages of the Crimean War. Now, the Crimean War was a bloody conflict that was fought between the British, the French, the Turkish and the Russian Empire since 1853. So it was a relatively short uh, conflict, a couple of years. 
And during the Crimean War, the Russian Empire suffered multiple defeats. So we have the Battle of Balaclava, for example. We also have the Battle of Inkerman. Um, these are two examples of heavy defeats uh, by the, uh, on the part of the Russian Empire. Now, because the Russian Empire was losing the Crimean War, uh, and by uh, 1856, uh, a year after Alexander II takes the throne, they had been defeated, uh, we see the true costs of the conflict in more detail. Because at this point, we see the fact that, um, in terms of economically, they spent around 45% of their total GDP per annum on the conflict. So every single year, the GDP standing for gross domestic product, the amount of uh, revenue essentially that a country earns, um, uh, essentially what GDP uh, per annum refers to is how much they spend per year on the conflict. They spend nearly half of their entire economy every single year on this conflict and they still were defeated as a result. In addition to this, we also see that one of the reasons for defeat was the fact that the Russian military was just woefully inadequate. So it was incredibly underfunded, it was very poorly trained, very poorly equipped. All of these different things meant that despite spending so much money on the conflict itself, the actual uh, result would always have led to, almost entirely would have always led to a defeat, owing to the fact that the uh, opponents had so many superior uh, military um, advantages and tactics and, and, and technologies. Another issue, a more domestic uh, issue that we have to think about is the Russian uh, question in relation to emancipation. Now we're going to spend a few lessons talking about emancipation because it is a very significant element of this early period of Alexander's reign. And emancipation essentially refers to the emancipation of the serfs, the emancipation of serfdom, the, the outlawing, the abolishing of the, of the system of serfdom itself. Now, in terms of the treatment of serfs and the experience that Alexander had, these things led to and influenced his motivation towards uh, trying to enshrine a certain amount of uh, emancipation. So he had travelled the empire and had seen serfdom uh, firsthand. He had seen what serfdom actually was and how it, uh, and how it looked and how uh, horrendous a system it was. He also served on his father's council of state, which allowed him to have a direct one-to-one -one contact with the idea of serfdom, with the, with this, with the institution of serfdom more generally. He also led serfdom, uh, the serfdom committee, so he would uh, not only be on the council of state of his father, but he himself also led the committee which dealt with issues relating to serfdom. So in terms of Alexander II's relationship with serfdom and connection and experience and knowledge of serfdom, we can see very clearly that Alexander II had a, quite a, a close connection, one-to-one -one relationship with this institution itself. Now, Alexander himself believed that serf emancipation um, was uh, useful uh, for a number of reasons, not just the ethical and moral motivation to abolishing what is essentially a form of slavery, but he also believed that it would curb tensions and help to stimulate the woefully inadequate economy, especially after the Crimean War, that's the, where they spent so much money on the economy, that he believed that uh, the, the, the abolition of serfdom would help stimulate the economy. Okay. And this was also a view that was shared by many within the sort of general ar aristocratic uh, part of uh, Alexander's family. So um, it was not just a view that he himself outlined as um, something that he was all of an outlier in. It was a view that was beginning to become more and more popular among the majority of the closer inner, I interconnected part of his family, the inner uh, aristocratic um, part of uh, the Russian state, essentially. And there were also a number of other motives, sort of external motives for the emancipation of the serfs. So we have political motives, we have economic motives, of course we have ethical motives as well. So we'll think about each of these in turn. So let's first begin with the political motives. What were the political motives for the emancipation of the serfs? Well, when we talk about the authority of the Tsars, the uh, the autocracy that the Tsarist regime had imposed. It depended mostly, just like with a number of other autocratic monarchical regimes, they all tend to depend on the nobility. Much of the nobility then relied on serfs to make money. 
the growing surf population meant that decline declining incomes and they had many had to be forced to mortgage their land okay so we have the fact that because the surf population is growing we have a greater supply of of, of labor of surf labor without the growth in the demand for surf labor which leads to a decline in incomes younger members of the nobility had become apathetic demotivated and also critical of the uh, of the regime itself and so given the fact that there was a dependence on the nobility itself and the fact that uh, owing to all of these other factors relating to the growth of the serf population and also relates to the fact that the nobility especially younger members of the begin of the nobility were beginning to become critical of the regime it meant that one of the reasons for emancipating the serfs could have been because of the fact that the nobility was becoming very critical and demotivated with the serfdom regime and so as a result of this alexander ii wanted to keep them on side by emancipating the serfs we also have economic motives so serfdom uh, had kept peasants where they were essentially it stopped them from moving and working in factories and towns this means that the internal demand for goods was low and it also meant that when we are talking about the moving uh, the movement of individuals as the modes of production begin to change as russia essentially begins to industrialize it means that the labor force being kept on um rural farms and kept in agriculture were unable to go to these inner towns and these inner cities where they can actually work in factories and work on industrial output all of these things are obviously important for economic production in the year of 1859 the empire's debt was around 54 million rubles okay so there was clearly economic problems and it was believed that a shift in uh, the the labor force the ability for the labor force to move around and to actually start to move into the towns and cities where they can work in industrial regions that would actually impact and help in terms of the economic stability and the growth of the economy itself now finally we have ethical motives of course so of, of it, one of the reasons that was that the the, the west having already abolished their slave trade uh, many many years prior believed that the Russian Empire should also do the same and abolish serfdom. Now, there were philosophical arguments which suggested that there was a certain immoral uh, aspect of keeping serfs like animals, which obviously makes sense. It was a very unethical system. So given the fact that there were also ethical problems and ethical implications from serfdom, and given the fact that we also have political and economic motivations, you can see why there was a motivation for the abolition of the serfs.